we thought we'd start with um, uh, Dr. Butler. As you know, he's been uh, doing a couple of historic, actually a four-volume set of historical uh, uh, book on, uh, on Baylor College of Medicine's history. Uh, we started our Board of Trustees retreat with having uh, Bill speak to the board, and we thought we'd have him do that again. So thank you, Bill. Thank you, Paul. This is the cover of the um, first of the four volumes, as he mentioned. It's published uh, about two months ago, and the other volumes will be published uh, either later this year or, well, two this year and the, the fourth volume next year. I'm just going to quickly run through the book with you. Uh, it's, it's three chapters. The first chapter deals with the move to Houston and the early development of Baylor in the Medical Center. The second chapter has to do with the development of the academic and educational programs. The third has to do with the seeds of the research programs at the college. Uh, shirt sleeve doctors write new Baylor chapter. This occurred the week of the move from Dallas to Houston. And literally uh, at that time, uh, we were moving into the Sears and Roebuck warehouse. This is where classes were held for the four years during World War II when building materials were not available to build the permanent facility. Uh, very early on, philanthropy became a critical, uh, important part of the college. Here, the three daughters of H.R. Uh, Cullen were giving $40,000 checks to the Chamber of Commerce to support research at the College of Medicine. This is literally just a, within a year of coming to Houston. The woman on the far, le your far left, is Wilhelmina Robertson, and she is the daughter of H.R. Cullen and the mother of Corby Robinson, who just served as our, recently as our chairman of our board. And of course, this is H.R. Cullen giving a check to $800,000 to Earl Hankammer, who was the longstanding chairman of our board. 800000 was the deficit to build this building you're sitting in right now. And it was the escalating cost during World War II that caused the deficit. And this was the first check written on the Cullen Foundation just formed that uh, month. And we've had a marvelous relationship with the Cullen Foundation ever since. And here is the dedication of the building in 1948, the Cullen Building. On stage to your left is uh, uh, former Governor Pat Neff and also Mayor Oscar Holcomb. At the podium is the dedication speaker speaking over national radio. This is the Secretary of the Army. You wonder why in the midst of all this three-day scientific symposium, director of the NIH and so forth, why the Secretary of the Army? Well, we were at war. And here are the medical students in the armed forces uh, in medical school training early morning before classes in front of the Sears and Roebuck building. But our faculty were also involved. They formed the 56th Evacuation Hospital. This hospital uh, landed in Casablanca, moved across North Africa, and then entered the Italian theater of the war. And here they are shown in Bologna. Uh, this is a coliseum that Mussolini built. You can see it's a soccer field uh, in their uh, tents. But even after the war, the Cold War, the Cold war mindset set forth with the fear of nuclear attack on the United States. And here in the front Cullen parking lot is this 18-wheeler, uh, and you can't read it perhaps, but it says Baylor University College of Medicine Civil Defense Emergency Hospital. We created this emergency hospital full of hospital supplies. It would move down to West Columbia, Texas, where they would hold uh, mock atomic bomb evacuations. The students, the residents, and the faculty all participated in these hospitals set up in elementary schools in, visit in their surrounding cities. Now the second chapter deals with the educational component. And I'm not going to say a lot here other than to say this is when the graduate school formed. This is when the MD-PhD program formed. This is when we saw a major shift in the curriculum to patient-centered uh, curriculum. And it was in coincidentally a lot with the fact that affiliated hospitals began to uh, appear on the scene. It's a, it's a period where we broadened the admissions process to become a national medical school. Here to the very far left is Associate Dean Schofield. He formed these 
admissions weekends, which we still have today, where students come and spend uh, two days visiting the college. It was also a period that women entered medicine, and the press had a particular fascination with women. They, some felt that women didn't have a role in medicine, and therefore uh, they had a great deal of press when women did graduate. It was also a period where diversity first appeared in the classes. This is uh, a, a graduate of 1965, Leo Orr. He is the first African-American medical student at Baylor College of Medicine. He's a practicing physician in Los Angeles, a delightful person. As I mentioned, this is a period where the hospitals appeared, and Dean Olson had the idea of having an affiliated hospital system, whereby students and residents did not just go to one hospital, but they had the advantage of going to all the hospitals. And it's hard to believe now that we didn't have an affiliated system, but this was the roots of it in the mid-1960s. Of course, this is one of the residence groups. This is uh, the first year residence with Dr. DeBakey. Uh, I just love the bobby socks. <laughs> Third chapter deals with research. It is hard to imagine the impact that poliomyelitis had on this community. These are patients in iron lungs out in front of the Jefferson Davis Hospital. But what few people really realize is that Joseph Melnick, who is the chair of our virology department, was the person really responsible for making the Sabin vaccine available worldwide in a safe condition by developing the stabilizing vaccine, stabilizing substance that allowed the vaccine to be shipped without refrigeration to developing countries as well as to the developed countries. The second devastating illness in Houston in that area, in particular Harris County, was tuberculosis. Here you see the Children's Tuberculosis Clinic. It was on West Dallas at the corner of Shepherd Drive. Deplorable conditions. They washed their baby bottles in the bathtubs. But along came Catherine Shu, assistant professor of pediatrics, who befriended R.E. Bob Smith, who was one, later became one of our founding trustees at the college. He refurbished the entire hospital and gave the children a chance. Catherine Sue carried out the, the landmark studies on isoniazid in the prevention of tuberculosis. And finally, just a word or two about uh, the research in cardiovascular disease. This is a picture of Dr. DeBakey uh, a month after he came to the college. It says a toe instead of a leg. He was studying sympathectomies and with the hope of saving the leg, even though he might have to sacrifice the toe. But shortly thereafter, in 1952, this landmark surgery of, of ex taking out an aortic aneurysm and replacing it with a homograph uh, taken from a cadaver at the Jefferson Davis Hospital uh, transformed uh, cardiovascular surgery. Shortly after that, he discovered Dacron, and Dacron was used in, instead of the homograph substitutes. He also uh, focused his research with artificial hearts. And here is the uh, Rice Baylor extracorporeal pump, which was developed and used first successfully in this patient. Ms. Vasquez was a, a person who had mitral and aortic d disease from rheumatic disease. After surgery, was not able to be taken off the heart-lung machine. Uh, this was put in place for 10 days, gradually weaned until her own heart gained the strength, and she went home to, to run her beauty shop in Mexico City. But by the mid-60s, uh, we began to get notoriety. Here, the Duke of Windsor came for his aortic aneurysm surgery. He was asked why he came to Houston. He simply said, I came to see the maestro. And finally, uh, one thing that Dr. Beggy was very instrumental in is promoting telemedicine. Initially on uh, two-way television systems within the United States, then the transatlantic cable, and finally the early bird satellite transmission. This was the first early bird satellite transmission to occur in 1965 between here and the University of Geneva in Switzerland. Two-way video audio. They were talking to him, watching him. He was talking to them and watching them. Time magazine said 300 million people saw this inaugural transmission of early bird satellite. 
And within two weeks, his picture was on the front of Time magazine with a feature article on Baylor College of Medicine. This put Baylor College of Medicine on the map by the 1960s. That's, that's a, a quick summary of, of the uh, chapters, the three chapters in the book.